Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I am just uh, so delighted to be here uh, sharing with you in this extraordinary family event because for me it has the atmosphere of a family, uh, of a family gathering, lots of old friends. Uh, you know, I think just about the, the opening question for each person I met is, and how long have you been a part of this organization? Put your hands up today if you've been part of AARP for more than a decade. Put your hands up. Will you give yourselves a round of applause? I think it's just absolutely astounding. Uh, if you've been a part of AARP for more than 18 years, put your hands up. Wow, look at that. And the, <laughs> the, most, <laughs> the funny thing is that most of them look 35 years old, so I can't do the maths. You know, I think this is just about the only organization I know of where people lie on their birth certificates in order to join. You know, <laughs> I mean, that. People tell me, except, well, I've been an honorary member since I was 22 years old. <laughs> Why? Well, I think it's an extraordinary organization. I'm a physician by background. I'm from London, as you can tell. And uh, we have uh, many organizations committed to the welfare of those who are older. I've worked in, uh, in gerontology, in uh, looking after people who are um, uh, more than 70, 75, maybe more than 80 years old. I trained as a hospice physician going into the homes of men, women, and children in my home city of London who are dying of cancer and wanting to end their days with dignity and respect in their own homes, surrounded by their own families, their own friends, uh, making their own choices. And I can tell you that one of the most rewarding things that you can possibly do is to give people back the time that they want. You say, well, uh, I don't know how long you're going to live, and it's true, you may be going to die, but you're not dying today. And tomorrow is another day. And uh, I guess I'm passionate, very passionate about justice, social justice. I'm involved with my wife in uh, NGO activity in many parts of the world, some of the poorest cities of the world, places like Bombay, Delhi, uh, Calcutta, uh, Uganda, uh, Zimbabwe, some of the poorest places. So I'm passionate about social justice. I'm passionate about what you do. I'm passionate about uh, helping people to find a sense of purpose and dignity and value and connecting the passions people have for life outside of paid work uh, with the life of, work, uh, of, of paid work itself. So, I'm really delighted to be here. And I feel honored and touched that you're willing as a family uh, to listen to me as an Englishman uh, on uh, some of these issues. Our and we've heard the same. a lot. A society in which everyone ages with dignity and purpose and in which AARP helps people to fulfill their goals. We heard a lot today about vision, about strategy for getting there, about the future. And that's really where I want to go. I want to think about the future. What kind of a world are we going to live in? And I spell the word future, F-U-T-U-R-E. And you have a book, it's all in there. So, uh, first thing I'm going to say, I'm going to skip through lots of stuff, otherwise we'd be here all week, okay? I'm going to make, I, I'm going to fill it out some particular dimensions of the future that I feel are particularly important right now for AARP. So you're going to say that was a bit of an incomplete picture, right? He missed out the one thing I hoped he'd talk about. Well, uh, we've got time for questions. Uh, there's uh, 30,000 pages on the website. There's six free books you can read. You've got a seventh in your pocket. There's 45 videos you can watch up there. So let's just look at one or two pieces of the future, if that's okay. The first phase of the future, and they spell the word future, is fast, and it's to do with the speed of change. And you know, some things change even faster than AARP. <laughs> they really do. That's a big challenge right now. And uh, for AARP uh, to stay ahead, to be flexible, to be dynamic, you know, the days of having one strategy or one plan are over. It's dead. It's finished. In this changing world, we need to have a strategy for unexpected things too. A strategy for this, a strategy for that. We need to be thinking about uh, the, uh, what, what we would do if scenario planning is very, very important. You know, a news story can destroy a whole organization in just one day. Let me say this. You are incredibly successful. I am just stunned. I am flabbergasted, amazed, excited, awestruck 
by the speed of growth, the depth of commitment, uh, the breadth and, uh, uh, and scope on, uh, of, of your organization. To have, you know, every time I blink, your membership has gone up by another 3,000 people. What are you now? 35 million United States citizens? You know, quite soon you'll be at 45 million membership. There's no doubt about that. It's only, the only doubt we can have is how long it will take you to get there. Unless something goes wrong, and this is what could go wrong. Go back to that slide again. This is what could go wrong. You see, a new story, one new story, can destroy an organization in a day. But if you can stay on the right side of ethics, if you can stay on the right side of politicians in general, if you can... Uh, huh. <laughs> and my friends, you're entering dangerous ground. You're about to reach a point where you will be able to say that you represent not just the majority of people over the age of 50 years across America, but the majority of all those in every decade over the age of 50. So you say, we represent 51% of all over 50 year olds, 50 to 60 year olds. We represent 65% of 65 to 75 year olds. We represent 85% of 85 to 95 year olds. And we represent 100% of all those over the age of 120. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, <laughs> who constitute most of our board and all the executive team. <clears throat> you shouldn't be laughing. You're <laughs> supposed to be celebrating this. An aging society, okay. But uh, the point is this, that things can happen very quickly and you're going to make some enemies. You've already made a few. With every success, with every bit of growth, there's going to come some people who don't like what you are and are scared. Congress is already scared about you. They must be. I know that. I don't need to be very intelligent to work that out. <laughs> to have a group that's growing this fast, that represents the group that controls most of the wealth in America, that can speak on behalf of the majority of it, on issues which are the most sensitive in our nation at the moment, in your nation and in mine. A group that could swing an election if you so chose, that could probably push a marginal vote by 3%. Easy. And all you've got to do is say, ask every member to ask every candidate just their answers to five questions and their voting record on those issues. You have power. You have power to make a break, a Hertz or an Avis, a Bank of America or a Citibank arrangement across the whole of America. It's breathtaking. Awesome, mind-blowing, exciting, dynamic. That's why you're growing. It's because you have that power. You have that ability to negotiate 25% discounts on a range of services or whatever you do, whatever the percentage is, for millions and millions of Americans. Breathtaking. And so people will want to knock you down and they will look for your ethics, they will look to challenge, they will look for a backhand or they'll look for any old story they can find. And of course, in every large organization, the larger you are, the more stories they will find. So let's be ready for them. They will find some stories because some people make mistakes. Not everybody's honest. But things can change quickly. Now, change gear. The genetic revolution has the power to change who you are, not just what you do. Did you know that your genetic code will work in a monkey? And your, <laughs> yours works in a centipede. <laughs> Did you know that you are 86% the same as an earthworm and you are 93% the same as an orangutan? <laughs> That's okay. Did you know that the cucumber genes will work inside your brain perfectly? And did you know that all of your genetic code is written in the same language? Microsoft Basic. And this is the miracle of life. You don't remember anything other than uh, just, just one thing. You remember something very important. The miracle of life is that every organism on the whole world is written in the same code. And 85% of all the genetic code inside every living creature, including every bacterium, every fungi, every yeast, is the same as in your body. And we can cut and paste whatever we like, one slice of your genetic code into a cucumber, 
and then add both of those bits into an oak tree and they'll work fine. Now, although you're laughing, that gives us the most staggering power because we can cut and paste this genetic stuff just like Microsoft Word. So we can create insects with two wings. Well, they have two wings anyway, but we can put extra pairs of eyes on those wings. Let's look at some other things we can do. If we go back to the slides. You know, the first 150-year-old human being may already be alive. I think that's quite likely. Think about it. What that means is that by the year 2154, we may be celebrating someone's 150th birthday. Believable? 2154? Yes, it is believable. And actually, it could have happened as a result of someone who was born uh, today. Now, this is how we are at the moment. Uh, 18 years to adulthood. Actually, I don't think it is, really. I think it's about 35. I've got an 18-year-old. <laughs> You know, you know uh, who here has got a 25-year-old and they're still like boomerangs? They go and they come. <laughs> you know, they're still funding education in a 33-year-old going through his fourth degree. And still haven't got married or had children yet. Why? Because adolescence is going on to the early 30s, isn't it? Have you noticed? Right. Now, it's a strange thing, isn't it? So we're extending, what was happening, very interesting, we're extending uh, childhood and, and adolescence right into what used to be adulthood, uh, certainly into the 30s. By that I mean adulthood, if you define adulthood as the acceptance of responsibility in a settled environment with long-term commitments to family and the future, I know that's only one very narrow definition, but if we were to take that, then we would say that 18 years doesn't do it anymore, right? Okay, now here's another trend too. These 50, the 60-year-olds are now wanting to retire at 50, so we've got We've got influences in our society who are giving out an image that basically it's okay not to settle down until you're 35. And another group of influences in our society are saying, well, I'm expected to retire when I'm 50. So we've got a period of sort of working adulthood which is being redefined in our society as a 15-year window. <laughs> now, actually it's unsustainable, isn't it? Let's have a look here, uh, back to the slide again. I want to know uh, who here feels biologically younger than you, than you think your parents were at the same age. Put your hands up. Okay, have a look now. Right. Who here thinks you're biologically a decade younger than your parents were at the same age? Put your hands up now. Have a look around. Well, ooh, my goodness, me. Who thinks you are, you know, you think of your grandmother at the same age that you were now, or your grandfather? Well, perhaps you say, well, I want anyway. Who thinks you're more than 15 years younger biologically than your grandparents were at the same age? Put your hands up. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look at the next slide. Okay, now, actually, I've redefined age. You see, uh, it's well, if we say youth, let's extend it from 18 to 20. That's very conservative. We could say it's 30 years old, right? And we'll say that the first lifers, the phase of life is a 40-year period from 20 to, 40, 20 to 60. And the second life of period is from 60 to 100. You look at me a little strangely there. And we call the seniors those who are over 100. <laughs> now, although you're laughing, I happen to think that life begins at 60. I'm sorry, that <laughs> you can't quite read that. But you could argue that life begins at 60, or it will do very soon. Now, this has very profound implications for AARP. Let me explain some of the reasons why I'm thinking about these things. By the way, you can redefine these ages. Let's go back to the slide again. You, we could push the youth up to 30. We could bring down the second lifers to 90. And we say, well, it's at three, three 30 year periods. The first life is uh, 30 to 60. Second life is 60 to 90. Um, you know, the extraordinary thing is most of you here will live till you're 90. Or not quite. But you have a really good chance of getting there. I'll tell you why. The life expectancy of people who are well educated in America, who are, who are passionate, who are, um, who, have, have a, who are reasonably affluent, have a reasonable standard of living, which would be most of you here, in fact the vast majority of you, in fact all of you, that your life expectancy is, is higher than the average American. The average American life expectancy now is what, 83, 84, 85? And it's growing. Did you know that every, I must spin on, did you know that every, every four years, 
the Japanese government tears up the forecasts for how long Japanese women will live. And they add another 12 months. Every four years, the Japanese government realizes they're wrong again. We live in extraordinary times. I'll just go back to these genetics again. Uh, we can combine any animal with anything we like. Uh, we've made a million transgenics, in fact, in the last uh, three years, just in the UK alone, just in Britain. That's a monkey mixed with a goat, a chimpanzee with a pig, a human being uh, with a fish. Yes, they grow to four times their normal length in 12 months. A spider's web gene mixed in with a goat. That produces a spider's web, by the way, in the milk of the goat. You just milk, just milk the goat, collect the web, and spin it out, and you get a new bulletproof jacket. <laughs> now, for those who are hair follically challenged, I have good news for you. Using stem cell technology and other things, it looks like we're going to be able to grow new heads of hair quite easily. And we'll certainly be able to grow new teeth. We're already doing it. Uh, you just take a, a small uh, bud of cells, and uh, you can grow them actually in the mouth. That's uh, being done now in various mammals. Um, or you can grow them in the abdominal cavity of another mammal. Um, who here knows someone who has macular gener degeneration? Okay. Macular degeneration affects 10 million Americans. And in fact, American citizens say they fear going blind more than anything else. But you know, macular degeneration is going to be a curable disease a treatable disease. I was talking to someone uh, at, um, at Harvard Medical School recently. Uh, he believes that uh, he has a treatment which is going to be effective. I'll just go back to that slide, actually. He believes that um, he's already restoring sight in animals. He takes stem cells from the animals. He injects those stem cells into the retina, adult stem cells, not from some embryo, from adults. And these stem cells regenerate the retina. He is going to start clinical trials in less than five years. And he believes that it will be a two-hour treatment as an outpatient, as a fairly routine therapy for people with macular degeneration within 10 years. It is absolutely astonishing. My first training, as I said, as a physician before I got into writing and futuring and other things like that. But I'm still very involved in medicine, and I've been tracking these things. I have to tell you that the things I'm talking about now are utterly astounding. It is stuff that would have been science fiction even four years ago. There was another research paper just in the last week showing clearly that you, uh, another miracle. You know, uh, suppose, suppose you, was, you were to have a heart attack. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Tom. Tom. Suppose Tom, uh, heaven forbid, but suppose you were to have a heart attack. Okay? We know now that if we were to take bone marrow cells from, from your bone, take a sample of your bone marrow, and we inject that bone marrow either into your vein or it directly into the heart, that it is very likely that we will see an improvement in your clinical function of that heart. The extraordinary thing is that these bone marrow cells, bone for heaven's sake, bone marrow cells will find their way around uh, your body. They will be looking all the time for heart muscle that's been damaged. And if they find any, they will move into that damaged area of the heart and they will help that heart make a perfect repair. I think that is absolutely incredible, don't you? Incredible. Now, did you, know, did you know this morning that part of your brain repaired itself? Did you know that your bone marrow is, has also capacity to regenerate brain tissue? How do I know this? I'll tell you how we know. You know, we, we, uh, uh, doctors discovered a woman who had had uh, leukemia, so she'd had her bone marrow irradiated. And uh, she had cancer, and she was given some bone marrow from a guy who was a close match. But when she died, they cut up her head. Sorry about that. But they found that she had a male brain. They found male brain cells in her female head. Now listen, my friends, how on earth did those get there? They got there from her bone. Why? Because her bone is constantly seeding cells into her head. Extraordinary. Now, we're rewriting all the medical books, I can tell you at the moment right now. So. Uh, not only can the brain repair itself, has the potential to repair itself, but we can get paralyzed rats to walk again. You remember the Christopher Reeves injury with a cut back, cut spinal cord, uh, it was actually for, uh, in his neck, from a horse injury. And uh, he's paralyzed from the neck down. And as, it, as you know, although your nerves in your arm regrow at three millimeters per day, those in the spinal cord do not. Well, they do now. 
We've discovered that if you take bone marrow cells from a rat after cutting the spinal cord and you inject those cells into the back of the rat, those rats start running around their cages six to eight weeks later. Clinical trials will be starting in human beings in the next couple of years. If my daughter had a serious car accident and was paralyzed from the neck, from the neck down, I would want her to have some of this stuff in her back as soon as possible. Now this is incredible stuff. What's even more incredible is this, that the, uh, if this was a new drug treatment, how long would it take to get permission from the FDA? <laughs> huh, well, you know about that, don't you? And by the way, that's not such a bad thing because it keeps some of the rogue drugs out of the market and protects us. That's what it's for. But it takes 15 years to produce a good drug, 15 years of research pushing it all the way down the pipeline to get it out as a drug you can use, right? Guess what? This isn't a new treatment. John, if you need some of this stuff, I'm taking your cells from your bone marrow. This is your property, owned by you in law, and you can compel me by law to put it back inside your body. It's not a treatment. After all, it's your tissue. I'm giving it back to you. And therefore, uh, you can move from animal studies to human studies in just four weeks, not 15 years. Uh, we can grow organs to order. Our researchers have grown a miniature perfect human kidney in the inside of a mouse. Now, you think, oh, my goodness. Just hang in there for a moment. Fast urban. Urban is to do with demographics. It's also to do with lifestyle fads, fashions, and choices. Um, and another big issue, uh, remember, I'm just filleting out one or two things here out of these six faces. The six faces is like a big radar screen. You just turn the radar screen and you see what pops up. Here's one thing that pops up, obesity. Uh, did you know uh, that 250 million people will have type 2 diabetes by 2023? One in three of all newborn babies born in America today will get diabetes by the time they die. One, uh, six percent of the U.S. population is diabetic, including one in four of those in this room. I won't ask for sure of hands. One in four of you in this room has diabetes. You may not know it, but you, you may well die from it. Now, this is a very serious issue. It's a growing issue. It's almost entirely preventable because it's caused mainly by diet uh, and imbalances within it. I'm not talking about insulin um, problems, uh, uh, problems creating insulin for a small child. I'm talking about overload of a body, uh, a systematic overload, so that we cannot carry, uh, we just cannot carry the mass that we have without pushing ourselves into diabetes and producing sugar in our urine producing catastrophic problems down the way in terms of mental deterioration, heart deterioration, uh, circulatory problems, impotence, all kinds of other things. So obesity is a very big issue and it's an example of how uh, while medicine is extending our lives, some of our lifestyle sh uh, choices are shortening it, which is why it's so absolutely vital for AARP to continue to encourage healthy lifestyles. Now, here's an amazing thing for me. Two out of three of all those who have ever reached retirement age are alive right now. Here's another. Germany is becoming extinct. So is Scotland. So is Italy. As so are many countries. Why? Because it takes, some people can't have kids, so it takes 2.2, 2.3 children per household in America just to sustain your population, right? Well, in Germany, it's only 1.2 children per household at the moment. What that means is, if you have eight grandparents, you only got one grandchild one or two grandchildren. It means 16 great-grandchildren. I mean, it's not, you're talking about a, a, a progressive shrinkage. It means there's only half the number of children in each generation than there should be just to keep the population stable. So you go through two generations, you've only got a quarter of your population. You go through three generations, you've got one-eighth of your population. My friends, you've heard about the population bulge and the graying of America. What people don't realize is it's nothing to do with well, it's to do with lots of things, but one of the things that's to do with is the failure to breed. If people stop having kids, then any society ages dramatically. And that's what's been happening. In fact, in America, you have Hispanic populations which are continuing to believe in parenting, who have fertility rates which are significantly higher. But English-speaking, white American population seem to have decided to give up on breeding. Same in my country. So you say, okay, well, we offset by immigration. 
Yes, okay. But I'm just saying, actually, you could argue that a very important part of AARP's care for the future aging population would be to encourage a younger generation to feel great about having kids and to encourage policy changes, tax regimes, and other things that will make it easier for parents to actually have children. Because actually, we cannot survive in a society where parenting has gone out of fashion. We have a crazy world where people are deciding to have children for the first time at the age of 30 at a time when I know as a doctor that fertility is falling through the floor. So there are only 50% of the number of children that should be in German schools this morning because the rest of them weren't born 10 years ago. What about longevity patterns? If we look at people who are more than 100 years old in the United States, our conservative expectation is that number will more than double over the next decade. So I wasn't joking when I talked about seniors being those over the age of 100. I think we should classify those over the age of 100 with a special status in our society. And there will be over 200,000 of them very soon. In fact, there'll be more than a quarter of a million before very long. So why don't we give them a name? Uh, uh, something. You know, I, I said, well, why do we call them seniors? They are senior citizens, for goodness sake. Uh, people over 100. Um, my, I've got a run of my relatives is 97, 98, and going strong. She's nimble. She's, she can't quite play football, but uh, no, she's, she's incredible. She, I think she's both her hips are her own. Uh, she doesn't look a day over 82. My grandmother, was, my grandmother was practicing medicine until she was 84. We were slightly worried about the medicine, but <laughs> actually, you know, she was doing medicals and things like that. Just she was working. She retired when she was 84 years old. Do you know General Motors now spends more on uh, health care for people who used to work for General Motors than it does on steel? Perhaps you knew that. And if we look at aging in developed countries, I'm glad you're interested in the global picture, because I am. I'm passionate about it. You know, over the next 20 to 30 years, we will see a 15-fold increase, a 15-fold increase in, uh, in the number of men over the age of six, uh, 60 and a 20-fold increase in the number of women over 60. By the way, AARP is predominantly a female organization. I hope you know that. Um, I haven't heard much discussion of that, but you're mainly a women's group. Why? Because two out of three people over the age of 65 are women in every developed country because guys, well, we tend to die off. Actually, you could argue that one of the, one of the greatest policy challenges for AARP is to improve the health status of a minority group within America, which are men over the age of 65. It's a minority group who are disadvantaged, who have a very low life expectancy, have high degrees of morbidity, poor health, poor quality of life compared to the women who are over the age of 65 who are motoring away until they're 148. <laughs> retirement age is the last century idea. Let me say that again. Re forget the idea of a retirement age. It's history. And people are already working far later in life. Even my grandmother did that, and she died 10 years ago. And society needs older people anyway. Society needs a mix and match where people are, feel able and are welcomed and encouraged, warmly encouraged, to work for as long as they would like to. Um, people opt in and out uh, with longer life expectancy. It means that someone can still look forward to three times as much years in retirement as they ever had before and still retire at the age of 70 because of that life expectancy issue. Most people didn't get any retirement in the olden days. They worked until they dropped. The idea of retirement is, an, is a late 20th century invention, really. By the way, people ask how, fund how retirement will be funded. And they forget there's all kinds of interesting things. Firstly, that people will, in fact, be working in bits and pieces. And people say, well, how horrible, Patrick, how terrible that you're going to require people in your vision of the future to carry on working. They say, you try stopping my grandmother from working. We get on saying to her, don't you think you ought to play some more bridge, play some more golf, and give up some of those medical? She said, listen, it's my life. How dare you tell me how to run my life? I only do it three days a week, but so what? I enjoy it. And the insurance company pays me well, which means they must value me to do it. So, uh, you know, we need to rethink everything we, we've ever thought about retirement. Um, and uh, not only will people be supplementing their income, and because they're healthy and well and fit and they want to do it, but also, uh, there's another issue. Four trillion dollars will move from one generation to another in America over the next ten years. From inheritance. We, will ne we have never in America seen so much money flow 
And you know what? Those who inherit are retired. Why? In the olden days, you, you inherited at the age of 43 from mum and dad. Now, chances are, you're 78 and you're waiting for your second hip and you're going into doing the laundry for 98-year-old mum and you're still paying the school fees of your 48-year-old going through his fifth education. <laughs> And you just inherit half a million dollars. You're 78 years old. So there's going to be some interesting things here. Lots of pensions are going to find themselves supplemented by inheritance. And the other thing, of course, is that many more people in America than has ever happened before own equity in their own homes, especially over the last few years. Um, and I know that share prices took a hammering, but the fact is that there is equity around. There's more of it than many economists have judged when thinking about policy and how people will survive. Now, 65% of all health spending is in the over 65s already. That's 470 billion a year in the United States of America. Listen, most diseases, most major diseases are age related. In fact, in fact, you could say that there's one common element in almost all diseases. Here is an interesting thought. Suppose I could find one, one mechanism. You remember I said that 85% of the genetic code in all organisms is the same, right? Well, 85 90% of all the processes in every one of your cells are the same, right? So if one of your brain cells is aging, it's probably the same reason why one of your kidney cells is aging. It's probably the reason why one of your skin cells is getting older and the reason why one of your, your hairs went gray. It's all related. There can't be that many mechanisms of aging. Common sense tells us that we might find one or two common pathways which could explain a way we could slow down not only the aging of a brain cell, but at the same time the wrinkling of the skin. Now that's exciting, isn't it? You see, we're talking about common mechanisms. Now let's go back to the slides again because, you see, um, if you decide that most diseases are diseases of aging, if you think about it, arteriosclerosis, it doesn't matter what disease, you, you pick an illness, and apart from infections, most diseases are diseases of degenerative processes, right? Most of the things that you're suffering from in this room right now are diseases of aging, and they almost certainly have a common basis. So we could find one biological key that could sort out 10 or 15 tables across this room. Now that's interesting. And it's a hugely neglected and incredibly controversial area for research, but it's one that AARP will have to get involved in. It's unavoidable. Aging itself has become a dominant unmet need. Gone are the days of saying, well, we're just getting old. You know, it's just getting old. Well, actually, if you start thinking about aging in a new way, you start thinking about two things. One, if it's worn out, fix it. If, it needs, if, it's, uh, if it's broke, regenerate it. Those are the kind of technologies I showed you before. Or two, slow down the aging process itself. Now, of course, you might say, yes, but Patrick, what's the point? See, in the old days, uh, you know, you had fun when you were 20 and then <laughs> gradually the energy levels went and you're worrying that, in fact, all that happens as you elongate mortality, uh, as you elongate life, is that you just land up with years and years and years of chronic disability. So what we're talking about is using medicine to compress morbidity. You're pushing that graph to the right-hand side. So like your Duracell battery. So, see, my grandmother died at the age of 94. Tragically, it was her brain that went. But everything else was fine. If only we'd been able to keep all of her body parts going in sync together. So at the time when her brain was failing was a time when her heart was failing, a time when her kidneys are going, a time when her bones are going out, and you think, well, this is her time. But it's tragic when you've got someone who could still run a marathon at the age of 92 in her physical body, but her mind is gone. Now, just to get us thinking about a new kind of world, I'm not saying you're going to live till 160, but there are some very interesting things that we've discovered. We found a worm which, which lives five times as long if just a couple of genes are turned off. Five times as long. Uh, uh, there is a, a drug that's under trial, has been under trial in humans, in mice and rats. It makes their skin more elastic and removes all the stiffening of their arteries. That's an extraordinary thing. So the arteries become as elastic as an 18-year-old, 
or a one-year-old mouse. And the tails spring back when they're stretched. Now, what would happen if we could find a drug that would restore your arteries to normal elasticity so you don't have to take blood pressure medication anymore? And when you look in the mirror and pull your skin, it goes whoop, like that. And we're not just talking about a face face lift, we're talking about a body lift. We're talking about every part, every centimeter of skin in your body becoming as elastic as a newborn baby. You're thinking, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, we've done it in mice and rats. Astonishing things are happening. Okay, okay uh, carry on. Um, there's a twice daily treatment that's been tried in mice and rats uh, called metformin. It's a drug for, tr for diabetes that's been here for many, many years. It has very, very few side effects. We've used it for 30 years in medicine. If you give it to, to non-diabetic mice and rats, they live for 20% longer and they have an 80% reduced risk of cancer. A whole lot of human beings on the West Coast have already started taking it themselves. They don't want to wait and find out if it works, by which time it'll be too late. We've discovered animals that are eternal. Some whales don't get old. Bowhead whales um, are come in two types. Some live for 200 years, some only live for 20. There's one gene probably that's different between them. There are two American teams right now in a race against time to find that particular gene which turns off the aging mechanism. If you don't get old, you still die, but you have the same statistical risk of dying from an accident or a pneumonia or something like that every year, but you don't age. We know that turtles don't get old. We know that sturgeon and fish don't get old, and we suspect it's the same gene. We also know that if you look at senior citizens, those who are over 100 years old, you find a gene uh, that is the same as that in long-lived yeast and worms. And you, find that, and you find that if that gene is expressed twice on both of the chromosomes, they are much more likely to live over 100 years old. So watch this space. We'll see a lot of this kind of stuff. We'll see a, we have seen a huge rise in life expectancy in the 20th century. It came mainly from reducing childhood mortality. If you save a child from dying, you add 80 years of average life. Okay? If you save an old person from dying for 10 years, from say 80 to 90, you only add 10 years. So you have to work much harder in the next century to get the same, same kind of improvement in life expectancy as you had in the last. If you eliminate all cancers, heart attacks and strokes and diabetes, you will only add another 10 to 12 years of life expectancy average. Death rates would need to fall in every decade by 85% in order to get an average life expectancy as high as 100 years. Now, so what I'm saying is, what's this space? Life expectancy will, inc will improve. It's going to go on improving more rapidly than the forecasts have traditionally implied. Which is, uh, we're going to find that other governments, like the Japanese government, will have to keep tearing up their forecasts. That will mean a redefinition of things like retirement, a redefinition of what middle age is, um, and it will have profound society implications. Now, those are the two phases I wanted to spend most time on. I'll just crack on through the next four. The tribalism is the most powerful force in the world today. It's more powerful than the, in the entire military might of the United States of America, China, and Russia combined. China uh, and uh, tribalism is to do with uh, every kind of conflict that you can imagine, mainly conflicts these days between in, uh, groups inside nations. Tribalism is the most powerful force for good, however. Tribalism is the most powerful force in the world in terms of a positive force. Is what makes families families, communities communities. And AARP is a tribal movement. We need tribes to give us a sense of identity, community, to know we belong to each other, that we have a value, that we have a purpose, that there is someone special that we can be a part of. And if we don't have a tribe because we've lost our tribes, we'll end up creating them. So tribalism is very important in AARP, and your, your greatest success will be in celebrating your tribalism. This is a pure tribal event. And uh, as you strengthen your brands, you will strengthen your tribes. Your tribes are your brands. Your, uh, the most successful brands in the world are ones which create this intense tribal loyalty. And you are a tribal movement, you are a people movement. And if you can harness that and, and prevent yourself from sliding into an organization, then you will rule America. It will not be an, uh, an organization that will rule America. It will be a tribal movement of people who identify with common causes, with passion, and dignity and a celebration of human life and everything that it stands for. That is what will move a nation. Fast, urban, tribal. The opposite of tribalism is universalism, globalization. I only want to say a couple of things here. There are totally unsustainable contrasts between the wealthy and the poorest at the moment in our society. 
My daughter has just come back from Uganda, where she spent three weeks uh, living in a completely African environment, uh, really, uh, as just about the only European. She said, it really hit me when I realized I was doing some math for one of the kids in the village, and I tore off a piece of paper to start a new sum. And she said, but you haven't finished using the piece of paper. And she had left a two centimeter band at the bottom of this large sheet of lined paper, and she turned the page. And it cut, it hurt her. Because in our village, each piece of paper has to count. And she realized, just in that small thing, that piece of paper and what it represented, the extraordinary contrast between her world and the world of the people that she was with, for whom just about the only manufactured object in that village was a piece of paper. Now these contrasts will, are enough to drive new waves of terrorist activity that could be so large as to make Al-Qaeda look like a mosquito bite. Let me say that again. Unless we deal with the moral challenges faced by these contrasts, we will find unstoppable new movements, just like you as a people movement. The people are just as active, just as passionate, but actually motivated by a much, much greater sense of injustice than anything that I've seen here today. The e-world, the globalized world, gives us new opportunities to mobilize people at an incredible speed. And e-voting, e-enabling, e-campaigning is here to stay and enables your movement, not the organization of AARP, but the movement that you are, to transform America at the speed of light. Imagine a world where someone's on a TV program, a leading politician is being interviewed on CNN, okay, about something to do with something or other, some policy that's been made or some allegation that's out there in the media. And uh, the person who's doing the interview says, uh, actually, I'd just like this to put this to the test with our viewers at home. We're just going to do a straw poll by SMS or, or by internet or by the remote control buttons on the TV. And we estimate we have 3.5 million people listening to this program. And we don't accept a poll as valid unless we have at least half a million votes uh, within a 10-minute period. But we're just going to take a vote. Do you believe what this man has just told you? And you see it, you see it scattering up, and you get up to 348,000. No, 28,000. Yes. So you say, well, that doesn't look very convincing for you, does it? Uh, do you believe that? Do you believe this politician should resign today? <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm sweating. If I'm a politician, <laughs> suddenly you find another half million voters come in, and now it's eight, because it's been buzzed around. Is it? SMSing all over the world. Turn on to CNN right now. We have the opportunity to get rid of him once and for all. <laughs> Suddenly, it's 875 votes coming in. <laughs> now that we have another 30 seconds, folks, <laughs> 878,000 say you should resign. Uh, 28,547, 48, I mustn't exaggerate, say that you should stay. Would you like to consider your position with the current government? This is powerful stuff. Um, and uh, the age of instant government, the age of instant polling, of instant judgment by the people on issues will open up great opportunities for influence for AARP. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical. Well, this leads me on to political change. You see, politics is dead in America, in case you hadn't realized. Let me just ask a question and prove it to you. Uh, who here is a member of a political party? Okay, put your hands down. Who here has ever signed a petition or campaigned on a single issue? It could be anything to do with the environment, human rights, care for the elderly, Medicare programs. Put your hands up. Now, I know that it's the same. Well, you're all activists. That's why you're here. I mean, the fact is that whatever, whatever I was to poll you on, the, the number of people who are campaigning or are concerned about a single issue is more than those who are involved in political parties. And that's one reason why the voting in American elections and in British elections is so catastrophically low. So what's replaced it? Well, as I say, it's single issues that's replaced it. Left, right, who cares? You know, many of the issues facing America today could be the war on terror. For us, it's whether to belong to the European Union. 
Um, it, it doesn't matter what it is, genetically modified food, embryonic stem cell research, um, whatever the issue is, these things no longer tend to be classical left-right discriminatory, you know, one or the other. We're talking about single-issue activism and issues rule. Um, their narrow agenda, their campaigns, their new causes, they're very emotional and often quite irrational. Environments, pensions, Medicare funding, genetic revolution, healthcare patterns. And every single issue becomes a regulation. That's the lesson of history. Retirement is a choice rather than enforcing people to go. The right of older people to work without discrimination. These are single issues. They're typical single issues. Now, I, what about the anti-aging research? You know, only uh, most Americans, in fact, uh, most Americans are very ambivalent, they're very uncertain about putting money into stopping the process of aging itself. I'm trying to distinguish between treating a heart attack and slowing down the biological clock in everyone who can afford this treatment. And this huge controversy about giving someone a tablet, which means that your biological clock, instead of going tick tock, tick tock, tick, goes tick. thinking, well, what happens to society? It's interesting that at the same time as this public unease about funding this kind of research, we see billions of dollars spent by Americans and AAR people, people in particular, on anti-aging things with all kinds of spurious claims. You know, anti-vitamin this and things like, things like that. So, you know why? So people want to live longer, but they're scared that everybody else may do as well. <laughs> That's the worry. Okay, so the answer to it, in fact, is to focus on health and well-being and uh, on the reduction of disease. Final, the final face of the future, fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical. How on earth do we live in this crazy world? Ethics, values, is the center of it. And this is the most important face of all for AARP. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it because you know this stuff. You've heard a lot of it before. We've been listening to it all this morning with passion and commitment about family, relationship, being loved, being appreciated, having purpose, dignity. Here are some trends in our society which are affecting um, those who are on the older edge of life. The work-life balance crusade, it is almost a crusade. There's this militant uh, passion about getting balance in life. It's a new thing. It wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. You know, my kids are middle-aged on their 18th birthday. There are people who are going into London Business School to do MBAs, it's the same at Harvard, who are already making lifestyle choices to get going downsize. In the past, they wanted to get to the board as fast as possible. Now they want to be successful, but not at the risk of losing a life. They want to have a life and enjoy it as well as being successful. It's both. Now, work-life balance is about family, and family is an absolutely mission-critical word for AARP. Because as we get older, we grow up. And when we, and the older and older we get, and I can tell you, uh, uh, when it happens when people are dying, I know this personally, the more you realize that things, what are they worth? Ha! But memories are the biggest things you can treasure, the most important things in the world, and relationships. Knowing that you're important to people, and that people are important to you. And then there's this other phase as well, this, this boom of volunteering across America, you know, a growth from 83 to 100 million. We're seeing an average gift of 200 hours per year of time given by a volunteer in America right now. If you cost that out, it was the average wage uh, it would be the cost of each of that hour of time, then you find that the, this economic contribution is 12% of the federal budget, it's, it's equivalent to that, or 4.5% of GDP. It's, a, it's an incredible sun, an incredible force, and it's growing. And volunteering, of course, is about community. And if one thing AARP is about, it's about family, that previous word, and it's about community. These two things together, these two passions which are growing in force, despite all the rude things people said in the Reaganite era, the Thatcherite era, the idea that we only were atomized individuals, that we only care for ourselves, that society is dead, it turned out to be a load of rubbish. Actually, there's a passion in people's hearts for community, a passion for family, a passion for relationships, and a passion to make a difference. And it's a majority passion too. Because 60% of the whole of America gives time to community causes they feel passionate about every single year. And that's not including the people who did it last year, but this year they can't. Or they will do it when they retire, but right now they're running a bank. 
Here are four words which I believe are going to be the most important four words to guide us in our future. Building a better world. I've given a $1,000 uh, challenge and I'll give it here today. It's only one prize per gathering, but I haven't lost a dollar yet. And the challenge is this. If you can find a mission statement or a product slogan, an advertising campaign or a TV commercial, if you can find a leadership strategy that works or an effective motivational tool that isn't built in some way or another on building a better world, either for the individual in some way or for their families or for the community they live in or for the wider world in which we live, then I'll give you a thousand euros or a thousand dollars, whichever you prefer. <laughs> I haven't lost... Yes, okay. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I haven't lost a dollar yet. These are the most important four words in the world. And in fact, of course, no surprise, they're at the core of your own mission statement, the power to make it better. And when we seize the moral high ground, my friends, we will find we will rule the world. Every leader knew this. Martin Luther King knew this. Winston Churchill knew this. JFK knew this. And so did Hitler. And so did Stalin. This is the leadership basis of every strong leader in the world. And every leadership speech has always gone this way, and let me demonstrate it to you. It goes something like this. There is no other way to motivate people than this speech. There's no other way to capture a nation or to change the world than this speech. The speech is always the same. I have never heard another effective leadership speech. This is the speech which has been used to promote the greatest evil in the world in the name of good and the greatest good in the world in the name of good. And it goes something like this. Forgive me, but you have to imagine 25,000 people here. Follow me, because together I believe that we can build a better kind of future for you as individuals, for those that you care for, for your families, for your friends, for your neighborhood and the streets where you live for the places where you were brought up and born, for our communities, our villages, our nation, the, for our great nation, and for the whole of humanity. Together, I believe that we can build a better kind of tomorrow. Uh, uh, uh. Not quite yet. <laughs> Two things missing. In God we trust. <laughs> and you can finish the rest. And God bless America. Thank you very much. Now, now, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what nation you're in or where you are. But that is the speech. And they will all to carry off now. <laughs> but, but listen, that's the speech. And this is my final slide. If that is your speech, what it is, if that is AARP's mission, then you will find this. You will connect with all the passions of people's hearts. And you will find that they will follow you to the ends of the earth. They will buy your products and services with pride. They will gladly promote the work of AARP. And what is more, they'll be willing to work for you for next to nothing. Thank you very much. Dr. Dixon, thank you.